people are really unlikely to ask the question. So I think my space, if you like, and I'm not saying it's yours, it could be anybody that has a, has a heart that breaks pretty quickly because they have a family member that's struggling and they have a great family, but there's something not working. Or anybody that sees a broken moment and they go, you know, I know something about how to fix that, but I don't, I don't, don't have the, the, they're not asking the right question or there's something not around them that they can reach for the language. I think that's where storytellers come in. What pulled you into the world of uh, making art? How did that happen for you? I think the natural thing for me was that I discovered that I really cared about what other people were doing when I was playing songs to them. So mom or dad would wheel me out. And there was a moment where I played a song with about 300 people. Wait, 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 wait. So you were a musician? Okay, so the, the musical side is just been natural since I was a kid, but didn't know that I had any musical talent until I was about 11 because we came from a pretty poor family and no one had an instrument. 11, so you're a pretty late bloomer. That's right, yeah. yeah. And I discovered that a party trick turned into a career. So for me, most instruments I can play, which is really kind of cool. And I've been able to do that in, in lots of places. I've ended, ended up on uh, musical theater, acting, and, and the songs that I was singing, for example, that little example I was giving, when, when I'm playing, I noticed that people would cry if I did a thing a certain way. And then when I was on my knees and just having a wee pray, I just thought, I think that's what I want to do. So, <clears throat> so what have you done professionally? Because I want to talk about what you're working on now, which you call the Thin Places Trilogy. But before we get to that, what, 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 uh, how had you been making a living and working as a Christian in the arts? So between 2006, 2009, I had the great privilege of working here on Broadway and directing. That was where I ended up because people used to just say, well, we'll get rich to do the job. We'll get rich to do the job. And first of all, it was just mopping up. So I'd be an assistant director on shows, musical theater shows, traveling around the APAC region. And then eventually I started writing shows and we were putting ones on in different countries, which is awesome. And eventually I, you end up with a team sitting on Broadway between 2006, 2009. And something happened. Uh, the global financial crisis hit and my dad passed in the middle of that and just completely blew the wind out of my sails. Um, at, at exactly that moment, after casting for the Broadway show, I felt that there was something that wasn't quite right, Eric. Um, I, I, it doesn't have to be me that Wait, so you it. Wait, so you were involved in a Broadway show? Yes, sir. To what extent? What do you mean you were involved in a Broadway show? Okay, well, my role as director was a privileged role of just being the dude at top, you know. Directing a Broadway stuff. show. Can you share yes, with us the name of this Broadway show? The show was called Angels. And it was, um, and I'd done two Broadway show, two Broadway versions of it beforehand that were off Broadway, and we were moving the show toward Broadway, and that was what happened with the global financial crisis. And exactly the same time, I lost the show, which we were already rehearsing, and I lost um, my beautiful dad, who was a, a hallmark of all good things in my life. And so that launched you onto a journey that you're on now. Correct. So, thank you, Eric, for pointing that out. My my main heart was already broken. Um, loved what I was doing, loved the Broadway experience, loved what I've been doing overseas, making television, sometimes moving toward the film ideas. But in me, what happened was this sort of explosion of, well, when you were casting for the Broadway show, I, I, I'm a real Excel spreadsheet guy. So 1,100 auditions, got them all down, told me you know, which ones go where, did all of those. 28 jobs, Eric. And then you have to decide if you've got somebody, if you've got a heart, and you've got people who've got teams who can write things, you've got to decide, are we either not telling enough stories or are there just not enough jobs? And in my heart, I went, well, I'm going to find that out. And that's where I went back to school after my dad passed, popped back to Australia, hung around in the musical institution that I did, the first degree that I did in, and then went and did the masters. My, my question was, how do you create a successful career as an artist? because I was really interested in that journey. Is there a problem in here? And I found a few things that I thought were really, really interesting. A lot of them echoed the great faith works and scripture, and I thought, well, that's awesome. And then shifted over to, they wanted me to publish that, and I said, hang on, I want to hand on to the IP. I want to put that and make that the subject of three films, and that's where we get thin places. Okay, so you've journey. been on this journey, and now we're getting to the punchline. You are making three films, a trilogy. It's called The Thin Places trilogy. Uh, tell us about that. Tell us about the term thin places. I know what it means, but I think most people listening would not have heard it. Okay, great. It's probably on purpose. I'm, I'm drawing people towards something they might know less about so that I can then explain it in the works themselves. The, th the three films are focused on that 
extraordinary time in life between 12 years old and 22 years old when you have to make decisions in life and you kind of haven't got as much responsibility as what's coming. And in that space, I really noticed having worked with prodigy kids for a long time uh, through the job that I do um, that happens to coincide with the teaching and the lecturing that I do as a, as a person who's working on their doctorate stuff. That time with prodigies ended up teaching me that they are really walking through some interesting times in their well-being space. And I thought, if we can create stories that actually talk to every person uh, that really makes a difference, it asks the questions, it throws the journey up for them, that, that we know they're probably going to have to face decisions over time, over time, and we can couch that in great storytelling, it's really likely that they'll find a better language for, for navigating the space. So the, the films that you're making, I mean, most people don't make three films at once. T tell us about this, uh, the idea to make a trilogy of films. Well, that speaks to the doctorate. So in the doctorate, I took the ideas of the IP of how do you... IP being of... intellectual property, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to annotate and translate. IP, not everyone know, knows what that is. Many people do, of course, but... Um, you took, say that again, you took so the... So I took the intellectual property, which means the substance of the, of the findings in how do you create a successful career as an artist, and I banged that up against our bigger problem, which is how do you create sustainable art or successful art in feature film? And I just went away and I acted like a researcher and spent a good five years taking a look at how do we take a script? How do we know when it's better before we make it? How do we know when so it's So it sounds like you're making, making art about art, which sounds very theoretical. How do you make it n not theoretical? How do you make <laughs> it part of a story? Oh, that's easy. Same way God did. Just humans. Just what we do is you take an artist who really wants a thing, a dreamer, and then you put them through their paces. And by the time you get to the end, you have got a decent amount of the three things that make a person become better. The th three things that were offered. Number one, and this is the masters, it's mentors and community. It's going to sound really familiar. So you've got a master's degree focusing on the idea of mentors and community. Okay. And um, what's revealed to you is important. And for us, it would be things like scripture or epithets or things that we live off. And the third one, the third final thing that you put into all of your scripts to create that beautiful narrative journey so that all the questions are answered is defining moments. And that's precisely what I felt I got from reading your book on Bonhoeffer. I felt like this is like episodically treating us as a listening and present audience specific to his defining moments. You're able to talk to us about our lives, right? You're able to talk to us about well, our lives. Well, of course, that's, uh, th that is, I mean, we're, we're getting very, um, let's see, what, what do I mean? We're, we're, we're theorizing about what art is. We're asking the question about what art is, which I think is extremely valuable, vital question. Um, and what art is ultimately um, has to do with what it means to be human. And I don't think, honestly, you can take God out of that equation. Folks, I hate to interrupt, but I just don't want you to miss any of the content we're putting out on here. We've just got some amazing stuff. So would you do yourself a favor and hit the subscribe button so we can make sure you don't miss anything. I promise you, great stuff coming up. Hit the subscribe button, thank you. One of the things that amazes me is that, you know, oftentimes we hear about uh, the gospel story, the story of Jesus, it's called the greatest story ever told. And the reason for that is that it's at the center of all art, all meaning, it, it is summed up um, you know, C.S. Lewis in that conversation with Tolkien, uh, when Tolkien says, well, yeah, maybe it, it's a myth, but what if there was one time when this myth became history? And ultimately, there is no way around it. You cannot tell stories without intentionally or unintentionally, wittingly or unwittingly, referring to the larger story. You know, today the cliche is the meta narrative. Um, but it's, it's inevitable that God created us. Uh, he puts us as characters in time, in history, and there's no way out of it. In other words, even if you're trying to avoid God, there is no way, ultimately, to avoid God. And it seems to me that you're, you're dealing with that. You're telling these stories, and you're, um, you're trying to get... I, I, it seems to me that you're trying to help people to see that their story leads to God, and what, the way I put it is 
uh, recently, I guess, I, I, I said, Jesus is the meaning of your life. People want to ask, what's the, what's the meaning of life? Well, I can tell you the meaning of your life. Jesus is the meaning of your life. Now figure out what that means. Right. So I think the question is easily comes down to, you know, what do you think the meaning of life is? Because you just indicated if you kind of want people to ask the question, what's the meaning of life? So that you could then go, well, I got the answer. This is awesome. It's all these great things about Jesus, all these great things about Scripture. Have a look at the great meta stories that are in, in real life. Have a look at church history. It's a crazy place if you want to start looking at how those things were played out. Have a look at the, the Scriptures and where that all started and what that means. And if you, st- you can pick anywhere then, but people are really unlikely to ask the question. So I think my space, if you like, and I'm not saying it's yours, it could be anybody that has a, has a heart that breaks pretty quickly because they have a family member that's struggling and they've got a great family, but there's something not working or anybody that sees a broken moment and they go, you know, I know something about how to fix that, but I don't, I don't, don't have the, the, they're not asking the right question or there's something not around them that they can reach for the language. I think that's where storytellers come in. And I think storytellers can bounce language back at uh, culture. And if there was more of us, that's better, I'm telling you now, because at the same time, they build the language, the bridges, the concepts, the threads that end up back at the heart of the person who is in those problem areas. And it might not be you, Eric, that helps the person that you really care about, but it might be me who tells a story that gives them the language to come to you and say, can I have a moment? I, I, I saw this thing or... I heard this thing or I felt this thing. Are we okay if, if we chat about it? It's interesting because I, I know that um, story, a, a lot of times I think, uh, and it seems like you're referring to it obliquely, but this idea that we often feel like I've got the answers and uh, you know, somebody says to me, I've got a problem. And, again, and we, we want to say, um, okay, here's the answer. Jesus is the answer. Do this. Boom, 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 boom. Oftentimes that doesn't people don't respond well to that, or oftentimes it repulses people. And what story does, what art can do, is it can kind of come alongside people at their own pace. And a lot of times when I'm writing my books, I think that I, I, you want people to go off alone with the book and to have these thoughts and at their, in, in a sense, um, on their own to be making these connections. And if they're making these connections on their own through someone else's story, they feel the, the safety, in a sense, uh, and then the freedom to, to follow where they think they're leading. Whereas if you're in a, in, in a, in a confrontational conversation, people often just pull, pull away. So that, to me, is part of the magic of what art is and what story is, is it is allows people the space on their own to discover. I think the real time, because we live in real time, and because stories are told in real time, music's in real time, you can't go forward and then come back, you have to play it in order. Acting's in real time, words come before you talk to somebody, then it comes back to you. Because real life is in real time, we just go back to kind of what we were learning in that little masters thing, which is we're gonna face the need for mentors and community eventually. It will be some form of answer for us. And that's why you know, every local church in, in all the world is, is, is a place for capturing hearts that are, that, are, that are really needing to hear and find a place. But you think about those other two spots, they're not as often found, which is this thing, this sort of lit way, something maybe God is talking to them about or some color or some focus that makes them go, that's a thing for me. Somebody needs to be there to enable those things, two things together. And I think we need to give language to the mental and community to acknowledge that everyone around them is God made. So therefore, we've sort of got a little bit of a heads up on how we can help them, particularly with stories and language. So they might not run up to us and say, I know exactly what you can do for me, please do it now. But our stories give them language to get us there or give them doorways or windows. And finally, and this is the thing that really, you can't take it away from a human that's been alive for more than um, six months, defining moments. People are having them all the time. Who's there? Is there a mentor and community? Is there a language from a story that they read, something that you've read, something that you've written, something that you've seen, something that someone said? Is there something there that's taking you back to H-O-P-E? So they might not find their way all the way back to Christ yet, but if they can't find their way to hope, I think it's my accountability. I got to get the stories out there. And that's why I'm here. Wow. Do we have time to sing? We just had about a minute yeah. left. What do you want? I don't know. You, you're going to sing. You got? We're going to do a thing, man. Well, I'm not going to sing if you don't sing. Okay, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why we're going to do this song too. Yeah. We're going to do just the first verse of 
what it's literally credited in research as the song, the top song that's transformed the world. And it's because it's been taken out of, and here's the big word in academia, context so many times, but as it's taken out, it becomes more meaningful. And this is the one. Do you like that? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. 